Teams talked today to draw on some old and new data tracing rainforest recovery at a particular big scrub site called Victoria Park Nature Reserve. It's to illustrate some of the processes and also work on a larger scale. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, and you can see that the main driver, I suppose, or the main vector <laughs> are these birds that, that actually transport the seed of rainforest trees. So I'm going to show you just some results of monitoring at Victoria Park over a, uh, a, about a 30-year period. So this is, this is what was created by our forefathers and mothers, a beautiful pastoral landscape devoid of rainforest. And it was the result of a great deal of hard work by a lot of people, but as well as the people who uh, worked hard to cut down the timber for various products, we had people who were prepared to work on the conservation of um, big scrub but right from the beginning. So here we've got the 1930s Scrub Reserve Committee at Alstonville, headed by Ambrose Crawford. Um, so. Uh, I think what we're seeing is just uh, re restoration was never a mainstream activity, but it is becoming so. <laughs> uh, and similar activities um, started occurring in the, in the late 70s and 1980s. This is a planting day at Victoria Park, Alstonville, um, where the Richmond Valley Reforestation Association and National Parks collaborated on a planting. And what you can see is a I believe it was buffalo or kaiku, someone else could interject and let me know what that grass was, uh, adjacent to uh, what was a remnant area. Now, um, that diagram shows the square remnant and the triangles above it and to the right of it were cleared pasture. The site, I believe, was a crown land and was used for picnicking by the general public, but it was also lightly grazed. So it, it was maintained as grassland around it. So that's before treatment in the 1980s. And uh, it was advised by Alex Floyd, a rainforest ecologist of very high standing, who, who has brought to the restoration community a great deal of insight about um, rainforest ecology and gap dynamics. And um, he, he recommended quite early on that we need only plant early successional species and that um, the natural vectors, the birds and bats, would be able to bring in species from the remnant, bringing later phase species. So in fact, as well as uh, advising on these plantings, he personally poisoned some of the isolated camp laurels that were in the grassy area. And on the top left here, you see um, a photo he took after two years after poisoning in the camphor, and you can see three or four native species present there. In 1983, five years after, you can see they're becoming more complex and moving up. In 95, 16 years after, you, <laughs> it, it, you wouldn't know that, that it had been a camphor laurel. So we're talking about a situation here where there's no planting whatsoever. This is uh, a natural succession process. And uh, the other day I took a photo um, 39 years after the poisoning, where I had to have the camera in, in portrait orientation because I couldn't pick it all up in landscape. Um, and we have the records to show, you know, how many dozens of native species are under there, but I just didn't have them to hand at the moment. There was a phase, 83 to 93, when Lantana colonised many of the gaps. So, um, uh, regeneration teams were employed, uh, expert regeneration teams working out the lantana and various other weeds. And subsequently, uh, we had a, a high density of uh, diverse native rainforest species underneath. And characteristic were where the camp laurels had been poisoned, native figs colonised, um, in, including uh, strangler figs that then uh, it's quite instructive when you go and look at the site now, you can see that the, the roots have wrapped themselves around the camphor and it's quite hard to see um, what it was previously like. 12 to 18 years after planting, and, I, and it's a 12 to 18 year range because the planting dates were different. So I um, undertook this monitoring uh, in 95. Um, 68 species were found in the plantation and that represented 72% of the 94 species in the remnant at that stage. Now that's um, trees only. Now 
most of those were found were later successional. So that's 45 out of the 68 were later successional, and by that I mean a combination of late secondary and mature phase. Of those, 56 were flying frugivore spread, and eight were wind spread. So back to the birds. Holmes in 1987 uh, listed these eight species as being uh, some of the more common bird species, uh, flying frugivores that uh, utilise plant species. Some of, the, some of them are more generalist than others, and it, it, it has to do with gape size and so on. Uh, and a lot more work has been done by Carla Catterall's team up, in, up here um, about the relationship between birds and dispersal, and we, we can thank Carla and her team for <coughs> fantastic insights <coughs> showing us which species we might plant to attract which birds that might then be able to bring other species. So uh, when I did the monitoring, I, I compared uh, three different types of plantation with a, a treeless opening, opening, some tall isolated remnant trees and some poison camphors. The orange highlighted ones are showing higher results for the uh, plantation that had an open canopied pioneer tree rather than a closed canopied pioneer tree. And that was not hugely different to the effect we were getting with tall isolated remnant trees and poison camphors. Um, there's a lot more information in this particular table than you can absorb right now, but it, it, suffice it to say that we're getting a, an increase in number of species and an increase in height of those species. Um, well, no, we're finding that out later um, when we do subsequent monitoring, but we're getting uh, more later phase species on the sites as time goes on. Here we've got some uh, graphs that depict that, but I'm not going into it because I'm making up for the time that I wasted. So here's the uh, 2018 Google Earth image. Now imagine that before it had that planting not happened, it's very likely that had the cattle still been grazing there, it still would have been Kaikuyu and Buffalo in those two triangles. And it now looks like quite a diverse canopy cover there. You can still pick out the remnant, uh, but we're getting excellent results. So those red dots were the um, tall, isolated remnant trees and the yellow stars, the poison camp florals. Uh, plantation B was the one that was most successful. So I subsequently monitored those in 2002 and 2018. And we're getting here a continual increase in latest phase species in the stratum above 2.5 metres in height. And even over, over five metres, uh, we're getting now um, some of the individual um, trees moving up in 2002 and increasing in 2018. And it could be that um, some of the earlier phase species are moving out of the system. That's why the data is lower for the earlier phase species at the later readings. If we want to split the mature phase and late secondary up again, we're seeing uh, increases again. So it's not just due to late secondary. And wind, we worry about the wind dispersed species. I'm often banging on about Buyong <laughs> because white Buyong is wind dispersed and it was the dominant in all these rainforest associations. Um, it was not very well represented and it's still not very well represented, but there are other wind dispersed species in the system and that is improving a little. So, does this matter? We're only looking at now a, a, a triangle. Yes, it's bigger than it was, but what is that contributing uh, to the broad project of restoring um, big scrub um, landscapes? So the key is there needs to be connectivity and those small number of remnants are terribly important as seed sources for the, the broader scale landscape restoration project. Camp Floral, as you will hear later from Dan, is actually acting as a receiving site 
for the dispersal of later phase species. It's a, a successional, um, uh, they're, they're early successional stands and they are increasing in, in, uh, in scale in the uh, big scrub landscape. So these remnants are terribly important to supply the seed source of more mature phase species. Whether we have enough of these remnants is, uh, well, we know we haven't. We know that big scrub landscape is working hard to create what are artificial remnants, if you like, artificial clusters of more mature phase species. Here uh, we've got a recovery wheel for the standards. Uh, it's looking great at the remnant level, but what we need to think about now is the whole landscape level. So the implications are, look, Victoria Park is a microcosm of, of similar processes that are occur occurring throughout the big scrub. There is absolutely no doubt about that. There's an increasing amount of regrowth. Have we enough plant plantations to provide seed sources? Tony's going to be talking about l later about how we increase that, increase the ecological functionality of those plantings so that they can act as very good seed sources. And my question uh, continues to be, can we somehow strategically locate those, those plantings? But that's questions for later, later on. So that's all from me.